Hello and welcome to our policy webinar for Churchill Fellows. Um, I'm Jonathan Laurie. I will be chairing the first half of this discussion and then I'll hand over to Sarah Canulo, who you will have met, um, for questions from the audience yourselves. The aim of the seminar today is to share experience from our three guest speakers, who I'll introduce in a moment, on how they went about influencing policy at different levels. And hopefully you'll come out of it uh, with a greater sense of how you can go about it, some top tips for doing it. And of course, if you want more advice afterwards, do email either Sarah or myself here at the Churchill Fellowship um, for advice on your own particular uh, plans. Um, I'll just share a tiny bit of my own recent experience here at, at the Trust um, of influencing policy. Um, very simply, uh, I emailed uh, an MP, a backbench MP, who was working in a policy area that one of our fellows, Callum Hanforth, had worked in. He was a former civil servant, so he sort of knew the ropes. Um, and he'd looked at the use of technology to improve public services in Estonia, Norway, and Singapore. So I emailed this MP who was interested uh, in that sort of subject. And we went and had a half hour chat uh, at his office in Westminster, uh, and it all seemed to sort of swim along in a fairly uh, bland kind of way. And then at the end, he perked up and said, do you know what? I really like what you've been talking about, and I will organize for you uh, an adjournment debate in the House as soon as you want. So Callum and I were both pretty bowled over by that. He's being offered a national platform for his ideas, um, and he will be taking that up. So that was a very simple approach, uh, and that's the kind of example of things that, that you can do. On a larger level, we at the Trust officially wrote to the new prison minister, Rory Stewart MP, uh, and told him about four or five of our fellows who had worked in that area of policy. And the interesting thing there, as an example, is that Rory was new in post, and therefore, when people are new in post, they're quite often looking for new ideas. And he came straight back and said, yep, yeah, I'd love to meet four or five of your people to talk ideas and bounce off my thinking. Um, and that has been arranged for next month, and it will be a, uh, a private meeting with five of our fellows where they will talk through his ideas and their ideas, and we'll see where it goes to. So again, a relatively straightforward way of approaching somebody who actually could offer quite a lot of influence on your behalf. So that's the kind of thing that we at the, at the Trust do, um, and I'm going to now talk, turn to um, three of our fellows who have done some of the same things themselves. So I'm joined here today by Eva Okwonga, who's a musician, activist, and researcher who has lived experience of mental illness, and she traveled to America in 2016 to explore peer-led music projects for people with mental health issues. Since coming back, she's presented her findings to an all-party parliamentary group of MPs on the arts, health, and well-being, and she's contributed evidence to a report that that group has um, produced. I'm also joined by Lindsay Graham, who's a registered general nurse and health promotion specialist. She traveled to the USA to explore food provision for children during school holidays, when often children on free school meals don't have those meals available. Since coming back, she's been instrumental in a decision by the Welsh government to provide one and a half million pounds of funding for three years for holiday provision um, and she's been involved with, again, an all-party parliamentary group on school food, and that led to a private member's bill being uh, presented to the House of Commons late last year and debated in January, and since then the government has committed to taking her ideas forward with pilot projects around the country. And our third guest is Professor Alison Neary, who's a researcher with a background in nursing, medicine, maths, and physical sciences, she traveled to the USA and Switzerland to explore what healthcare can learn from other safety critical industries. And she's now chair of the healthcare and workforce modeling at South Bank University and has spent time influencing people in her professional sector. So those are some of the range of uh, ways of influencing and groups that you can influence um, that our fellows can talk about. So I'm going to talk first of all to Eva. Welcome to uh, today's <laughs> webinar. I wonder if you could just briefly tell me when you came back from your travels, yeah. <laughs> how did you go about trying to influence people? How did you think it through and then approach it? And maybe you could give one top tip 
to our listeners? Well, I would say it's never too early to start because I actually approached the APPG shortly after our first seminar when we um, were given the go-ahead for our fellowship to have the first mental health seminar. And um, Julia said something really awesome. She said, this will open a lot of doors. She hadn't, funny enough, hadn't sort of occurred to me. I was very new to the trust with them how powerful the church or name could be. So she said, and, you know, if you're aiming somewhere, um, if you're looking at government or anything, aim high, then aim sort of two steps higher, I think she said. I thought, oh. <laughs> so I was one way of thinking about that. Mm-hmm. And um, so um, a field that I love is, of course, arts and health. And I follow the work of the APPG online. So I thought, oh, let's just, like, oh, let me just email them, see what they say. And literally within about two hours, within about two hours, I had an email back. You know, I just outlined my fellowship, my practice in the community and what I was hoping to achieve. Within about two hours, it's at the end of the day, the secretary had emailed me back saying, can we talk about this a bit more? So I thought, oh, okay. So um, so sometimes if you don't ask, you don't get. And that was the lesson to me, just having the courage. Julia's talk just gave me the courage to ask. You know, if I could participate in some way. So that was before um, I even left the country. Um, and so I had a dialogue with them for several months while preparing for my fellowship and actually had my first meeting at the House of Lords in the July before I travelled in September. So it was all kind of moving before I actually went to America. And it was good because it also helped me frame a bit more what I wanted to look at while I was there looking at the gaps they had in their research and talking to the people, you know, um, who worked in Arts and Health at the coal face, you know, also very high up, what they needed kind of thing. So I was able to go away and then do my fellowship and kind of come back with a bit of reconnaissance, like, like a mission, say, well, I found this and that. And I know. So that was helpful to get in there early because, of course, there's different meetings, I don't know if you say these but they, all these kind of APPGs and cities have schedules. So the earlier you get hold of the schedule, find out when you can get to meetings, you can fit that in with your traveling. And when you come back and things work and whatever. So that was helpful. Yeah. And I believe you've made quite a lot of use of your local MP. Oh, yes. Uh, well, it's quite hilarious and also quite awesome. Boris Johnson's my local MP. <laughs> and the first time I met him, I had just got my letter saying I got my fellowship. So I had actually it with me. He did a local mm. talk to people that worked in the town of Uxbridge, there's quite a lot of people there, a few hundred people there. And I just got the letter, I think, the week before, so I thought, let me take it along. I knew that he kind of liked Churchill. So when I showed him this letter with Churchill on it and all this, he was immediately, you know, interested, and we struck up this conversation that has sort of continued for the past almost two years. And it's been lovely because he has, um, he's, he's quite an interesting person. He loves to learn, and also he has, um, he's written a book about Churchill. So, but he didn't actually know much about the trust, so it'd be nice to share with him the work the trust does. And of course, Uxbridge is sort of Churchill Town. I mean, we've got a uh, theatre named after him in Winston Churchill in Ryset. We've got streets named after him. You know, we've got the Battle of Britain bunker, which has just got a £6 million refit, uh, where he, you know, used to go and direct the RAF war effort. So it's been nice to get... Um, involved, you know, with, and as Boris came to Uxbridge, you know, 2015, he has been there long, it was nice to get him connected a bit more as well with what's going on with the Churchill Fellowship, Churchill Trust, but also locally. So we've had some great chats, you know, and I've, I've given him a copy of my report, which was hardbound, and he was very happy to receive it, um, and actually took great interest all along in how I was getting on with my travels. And I think, interestingly enough, I think having been Mayor of London, He's, um, he loves a good success story um, because, you know, that's what London is. London is a bit like New York, you know, people come here and their lives can get changed. It's a great opportunity. So he's, he's loved to see the, the, the story, that's, that how my story has grown from, you know, being in psychiatric care and, you know, being in homeless shelters and things and, you know, getting myself together with the help of a charity like the Churchill Trust where I can inform government policy. So he's been sort of quite interested to see how my story developed. Um, and also to see how we can apply what I've learned locally. So, yeah, it's been fun to get to you. I bet. I bet that's an interesting experience. (laughs) (laughs) Alison, can I turn to you and ask you the same sort of question? How did you go about thinking about influencing people and who and what happened then? 
uh, for me, it was it was slightly challenging because I I went with one idea for my fellowship and came back with something completely different. Um, so originally, I wanted to look at high reliability, safety critical organisations and how they use data, um, particularly to maintain safety. So <clears throat> the the thing that I really came back with though was a lot of information on that, but also how those organisations have a very different approach to workforce and how they look at their workforce and particularly its contribution to safety. So I went with a, an idea of who I was going to have some, how I was going to have some influence when I went and came back with a different kind of audience, I guess. So it, it took a little bit of changing, but a lot of it overlaps. So there's a, I'm particularly interested in the safety of patients, not just in hospital, but in community settings and also the safety of the workforce that deliver care. So there was a, there's a patient safety all party parliamentary group. There were people like the Royal College of Nursing um, and some of the other sort of um, workforce representatives. But then I realised that actually it was more about policy and influencing policy makers, and not just in healthcare, uh, because this uh, this crosses social care, it crosses lots of other areas, and in fact a lot of the public sector. And I had to sort of revelation while I was while I was traveling that we model a workforce as if it's a service industry and not a safety critical one and all the all, all the organizations went to model the safety critical industry workforce model and so when I got back it was really about trying to see who we could influence to change that perception so it became less about presenting facts and more about perception um, and it's been very well received. I was I was quite surprised. One of the interesting things that it made me look at the research we've done in a completely different way. I went back to our data and I realised that lots of people were had quite fancy job titles or calling themselves things like advanced nurse practitioner who weren't on the NMC register. They weren't registered nurses. Um, and last week, the chief nursing officer for England, um, in agreement with the other three chief nursing officers, has decided to move the legislation to protect the title nurse from that that kind of thing. I think my top tip actually is I, I went with a very set idea and thinking about how I would use what I learned when I came back and it was really about being open to other ways of doing that um, and the biggest way that I think we've been able to, to spread that learning has been digital platforms. Mm -hmm. So um, I rather naively put my report on LinkedIn and within about three days it had been downloaded 2,000 times that's fantastic. <laughs> um, I've also um, had quite good relationships with lots of journalists on Twitter, and they were retweeting it. So people were were, were doing that. And and you know my, my my hope is that we can change perception of this work. It's important work, but it's seen in a specific way. Um, and you know for the, for that sort of 78 year old lady with no family living on her own in the community, we really need to think about how that workforce contributes to her outcomes and, and has so, what it's like. So you were aiming to change, in a sense, culture, <clears throat> cultural practices, behaviours, attitudes, and, and a large part of that was getting your report out there through these digital platforms? Absolutely. Um, I didn't originally go with that intention. I, I went with the intention that I'd learn how these organisations would use data to inform safe practice, but actually I came back with something completely different. <laughs> And I gather you've got 10,000 followers on Twitter. Just under, yeah. <laughs> How did you do that? I think um, a lot of this message, when we talk about influence, we, we kind of talk about organisations and we talk about, you know, I, I certainly think about employers and parliamentarians and policy makers, but actually this message spoke to the workforce. So the majority of people that follow me on Twitter are people who have real life experience of this. And so I've lots of um, lots of the healthcare workforce type people, um, some policymakers, a lot of people from social care who feel a little bit abandoned, I think, from the the, the commentary I get. Um, so it's it's about speaking directly to that audience too, not just people that are decision makers. So for me, that's quite important. Yeah, reaching right down to the grassroots. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's where change happens. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Alison. Lindsay, can I turn to you? Hello, fellows. How you how you went about influencing and what's happened? Um, I wish I had more than twenty minutes to tell you what's happened since. But I, I'm I'm a bit like Eva in that 
I knew before I went what I wanted to do with the fellowship when I came back. So I made a point of telling everybody and their dog where I was going and what I was going to be <laughs> doing. So I wrote to um, policymakers at local, regional, national level, right up to ministerial level, to tell them that I was going and what I was going to do and um, what I hoped to find. And you know, I was going to be sending them my report when I come back. So the simple thing about reaching out and reaching out to the top, and I mean, I wrote to everybody, um, particularly those uh, ministers who had education or well-being in their portfolio, because I, I, because the previous job that I had, I knew who was in the sort of policy things. I also, like um, my colleagues here, used the uh, all-party parliamentary group on school food and the all-party parliamentary group on hunger. So I used two APPGs as well, um, and as you said, I put a slot in the diary um, to speak and tell them about my, my fellowship. I also use social media. I'm a Twitterer as well, so I tweeted all the way through it and wrote a blog and took lots of pictures, and that's a great way to remember things. The other thing for me was the, the simplicity of the message. I, I knew there was a policy gap area, um, and having a very simple message like what happens to our free school meals children when the schools shut was one that people could get. So I suppose my tip for me is, Make sure your message is accessible, easy to understand, and also that what you're telling um, is a positive story that has a solution. And for me, the solution was um, not just about providing meals, as America had done in their 40-year policy, but that we could do better in this country, that when you learn best practice, you think, how can I improve that? Um, and to me, it was a social justice issue and an equality issue, and I felt that we shouldn't just feed children, we should open up opportunities for them through education enrichment, through skills and, and policy, um, local policy about access to our schools when they were closed. And it's been remarkable, it's been life changing since I came back. I used to do management consultancy and before that I was a nurse, but I just binned it all and started again. And you know, I'm nearly 60 and decided that this was something that I wanted to do. So I've spent the last five years campaigning and lobbying to change policy, and I'm pleased to say that it's happening. You know, it's, it's really happening. I can't quite believe it, but it is. <laughs> and, and you've managed to have leverage with regional governments in Wales and Scotland and also national government. How did you get there? told me that you had been, quote, a network tart. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I have. I've been a complete network tart. Um, meaning what? Meaning that um, if there was an opening of an envelope, I would turn up at it. There was, um, a, a, you know, events, uh, you know, if there was a um, media opportunity, I would either tweet or, um, particularly if I saw conferences or seminars that were related to hunger or children's well-being, then uh, I would write to them and say, I've got a story to tell, or I would send them my report. Sending the report was fantastic. Honestly, it opened, you're right, it opened so many doors, I couldn't believe it. Um, and then, you know, linking, finding, getting people's business cards, always getting their phone number, always getting their email or their Twitter name, you know, making sure that you kept those contacts live. That's been hard work. Probably in the last four, four years, since I've done the fellowship, I've probably traveled in excess of 100,000 miles around the country just Speaking at conferences and stuff like that, I've been on national telly and radio and French television and all sorts of things. It's been, it's been amazing. But the best part for me is turning up now to the clubs that have been started as a result and seeing children coming in grey-faced and then going out happy and smiling and engaged in their communities and families getting jobs. and It's just fantastic. It sounds fantastic. <laughs> and, and that picks up on something that, Alison, you told me earlier, which is that you've been on Radio 4 a couple of times. Yes. How did that come about and how useful do you think it was? 
I think it's really useful. I was, I was lucky enough to be invited onto Women's Hour a couple of times um, because I, I never really appreciate how much of a feminist issue this is. This is the healthcare and social care workforce is a majority female um, workforce. So it's actually it's actually quite a big issue, and and the way that hasn't helped the way it's been perceived, I think. So it was I was able to um, talk a little bit about our findings really, and and the findings directly come from the fellowship. So if I hadn't travelled, if I hadn't met a lot of the people that I had met, if I hadn't been able to compare and contrast the different kinds of industries, I think it would have been a lot more difficult to articulate the value of the work that people do in these industries um, and in healthcare generally and its importance in terms of outcomes to patients. Um, just a reminder to everybody that we are taking questions. If anybody wants to type one in, um, we'll be discussing them in a minute. Um, I'm going to talk now around the table um, uh, to our three speakers, who are Eva Okwonga, Alison Leary, and Lindsay Graham. Um, something I wanted to ask all really was, what did you find when you started to actually try to influence policymakers? What were the kind of soft entry points? What were the, the half-open doors that were easier to push? Eva. I think that um, my colleague here touched on it about <coughs> whether being in Parliament facts and figures and money is really, really important. You know, integrity of ideas, yes, but if they don't feel they can fund it, that will close it down pretty quickly. So mm -hmm. um, I remember I went had one meeting with Boris Johnson about the project I, you know, founded ten years ago, Music in Mind, which is a peer-led music project, and I told them all the things we did over the like, eight years. And I said, um, oh, and we funded it all ourselves, and we raised all our own money, and we used an existing building, and we didn't cost the council anything. Oh, his face. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, you think it was, I, I thought, mm. oh, he thought, oh, my goodness, you know, and he, his face was up. I thought, oh, that's how to get a politician. Show them what you can do with what is already there. Yeah. Um, and actually, sometimes, it's, actually, I found the good key is to be generous. Don't say, give me, give me, give me. Say, we have this. Can we just have an open door on that and work together and, you know, partnership on something else? Meet them halfway, um, you know, and um, be creative as well. Because that's what I found. Um, I mean, well, that's British. You know, we're entrepreneurs in this country. And we're very eccentric and diverse. And that's what makes us stand out. So um, it's important that your idea is, you know, don't, even in, more, in your own thought, don't get weighed down by cost. Okay, something might cost a certain amount of money, but then there's something else you can save on. Mm. Um, so when it comes, you're right, the facts and figures, the money is important. And also, I would say being unique is important because when my first meeting at the House of Lords, we had a huge round table. There's all kinds of, you know, very important people there. There was me. And um, what I noticed was, quite generic statements from you know everyone there was doing really important work but i could see you can see everyone has a similar battle they're facing often money based but then you see you can kind of see the eyes glazing over the people <laughs> in charge and sharing i thought oh my gosh I thought, when they get to me i thought i've got to catch your attention so i thought i will just tell my story and be myself and i was you know, very honest about personal stories in my life and people i knew personally that had really benefited from arts and health, from music in their mental health recovery, from being in a peer support group. And I had to find something that nobody else could really talk about, mm. something totally different. So you've got to find your edge because Parliament is very um, full of, if you look how many people go in there day in, day out, there's hundreds of people, hundreds of reports floating around. Yours has got to float mm. to the top. So find your edge. And often it's the thing that touches your heart the most. Um, you might and you might be scared and think maybe no one else will get it, but that's okay. If you're passionate about it, that passion will shine through. Um, like you were talking about the um, children and seeing even the pallor leave their faces and their joy come back when they have a good meal. So something like that, if it touches your heart, it will touch somebody else's. So, yeah. mm. And Alison, you've done a lot to try and influence your professional sector. What were the, the half-open doors there when you started pushing? <laughs> Some of the half-open doors I didn't even expect would open, actually. So it was quite interesting how um, sort of more informal networks work. So I, I'd actually agree with Lindsay, but, you know, network, 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 really, really important. Um, you know, I, 
it's been quite interesting. I've, I've had colleagues who've known you know, previous government ministers who've then introduced me to current ministers, and that's been incredibly helpful. So it's not always direct influence. I think sometimes utilising indirect influence, and and having that compelling story, actually having something that's that people are going to be able to connect with. So I think that that kind of thing is really important, and then also the grassroots aspect of it. So if, if the story speaks to people from grassroots, that really, really helps, I think. And and it's amazing who knows who, actually. Like that's really, mm. I, I found that quite fascinating in terms of who has influence on, on what decisions. Uh, it's not always who I assumed would have. So it's sometimes thinking a little bit more laterally in that respect. And Linda, you've had, obviously, as you told us, a fair amount of success in this game. But what were the obstacles that you found that were hard to overcome? The obstacles. Um, people, I think for me, it was people not believing that this, this, um, that, that hunger was an issue for our, our children in this country. I think people just didn't believe that it would possibly be happening. So it was also trying to make sure that there's a decent research base to, to back up what I was saying, um, or have been saying for a number of years now. So I think the big, biggest challenge for me was being able to utilize my report or success that I had with those challenges was that before I went on my uh, Churchill Fellowship, I didn't have enough evidence about that. But when I went to America and came back with the learning from there, with the evidence to say, look, this is a problem in this country, which is, you know, younger than ours, um, we we have exactly the same issues and this is how we can solve it. And then it was like, it was like a door opened all, from all over the country. People started writing to me or emailing me and saying, yes, Yes, this is really a problem for us, you know. Um, and then when when you got you start gathering that evidence and the data, and you have to tell a good story. Yeah. You have to be a good storyteller to explain to people how things happen and the benefit of what you're describing. And all these stories start flooding my way, and then I started visiting projects, and then I had more stories, and you know, and the stories <laughs> make more stories, and your network gets bigger. Um, and you call in favors. You know, I had an extensive professional network, an extensive personal network um, and, a, and a political network as well because of the kind of work that I'd done previously. And I called in a lot of favours. I said to people, we need to do something about this. And and people just joined in. It's just become a bit of a movement now, really. <laughs> That's quite interesting because one of the things I, I wanted to ask was what are the kinds of arguments that tend to work? What sort of things? You've talked about money arguments. Mm. They work and maybe not asking for extra resource but just a redeployment and then emotive stories I suppose. For me it was a it was a moral justice issue, it was a social justice issue and an inequality issue and a rights issue and particularly for children who who aren't able to make those decisions or are not equipped to in this country yet and we're signed up to the UN convention and you know and UNICEF is telling us that we're not doing well so being able to say globally we're not performing well here guys you know we need to do something about it um, and the local people, the local grassroots folk, were doing something about it, and that was to the shame of the politicians. So you use whatever lever, levers you can, be it global, local, regional, national, whatever, to make your case. And that's what I say about aligning to policy. Mm. And, and from what you just said, you, you, you'd um, identified some wider issues that your particular topic fitted with, moral issues, yeah. human rights in effect, yeah. and so on, which are, are much wider and have great leverage. Yes, definitely, definitely. And then the other thing is, children tell you, children tell you what it's like, they tell you the truth. And you know, we have that thing about out the mouth of the bees. And when you ask children about hunger, they will tell you. Um, it's very difficult for politicians to ignore stories about children or what children say to them. <laughs> mm. Well, I suppose you could <laughs> extend that to any other kind of beneficiaries, yeah. the people who are going yeah. to be helped by your project, yeah. your topic listening to them and finding out what their arguments are probably mm. works. Have you done that, Eva? Yeah, um, I think what's interesting is talking about politicians, like I remember when I first went in there, I would say to anyone, be open-minded and put the newspapers aside because we all hear stories about this person, that person. They're still people. They're turning up to do a job every day. They're getting quite a lot of flack for it. Not saying they're all perfect, but what I found was so interesting was when I let help them feel they could make a difference. Um, I think politics has become a lot of a numbers game, but they're, they're, those politicians, they're still people, they still have families, experiences, their own struggles. And to be honest, 
most people want to feel in life they can make a difference. And so being positive and hopeful and letting people know that their contribution is part of a process that will touch someone else's life, it helps us feel more connected. So I think that was really important to me. Um, but yeah, so definitely that, because I know that other people have said also to not change yourself when you go into these big arenas, um, because you know, you've got people there, oh, I've seen that one on TV, and I've seen that, you know, and that one's, you know, ministry, isn't it? Yes, they are, but you are someone important too. That's why you've been given a fellowship, and that's why you have a dream to make a difference. There's something you can do no one else can do. Um, so it's still believing in in what, in what your mission kind of thing, you know, and, um, yeah, and be yourself, that's all I can say. It makes all the difference. Yeah. I think there's, um, Alison. It's quite interesting because I, I, one of the things I think the fellowship gave me was the ability to get over new ideas without directly criticising current policy, even if I thought mm -hmm. current policy was wrong. So it took a lot of heat out of those conversations. But when you do go and speak to policymakers, we can say, well, this is this is how NASA does something, or this is how mm. these guys think Boeing thinks about their workforce, um, without saying we're doing it wrong. And because as soon as you say we're doing it wrong, you lose you lose the conversation. So it was it was a really kind of nice buffer to have actually quite frank conversations with people and exchange a lot of ideas, but without the heat and without the negativity that might come out of that. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from a listener. Yes, Sarah. we do indeed. It's about the practicalities of influencing policy. So how do you plan and organise your policy efforts? And how do you pace yourself, fund travel to events, meetings, etc.? I suppose that one of the things that I did when I came back was I kind of drew up a plan of who I wanted to target first. And I wanted to target Scotland first. I made that because I thought, well, they've got 32 local authorities. In so think strategically about who you want to target first, your sort of low-hanging fruit um, and the people that are mm. easy for you to get to, um, be that locally, regionally or nationally, who's going to be easiest to travel to, um, email, tweet folk, you know, using the social media and the, and the internet was, was a cost-effective way, but also um, I was lucky enough to be able to do the, the speaker circuit, I, mm. I think I've done probably in excess of about 60 different conferences, and probably more than that now on seminars. And when they asked me to speak, or when I when I sort of tarted about that I would speak, I did say, and you will cover travel costs, won't you? Um, which was the last line I always used to put on my letters. And generally, they would, you know, because it was an interesting topic, they would do that. But you've got to ask. Don't try and fund it all yourself because it's very expensive. Yeah. Um, so start local uh, and speak to your local people and, and get folk behind you who will help champion what you're saying. Um, was the other thing as well. What was the other thing on the question? So how you pace yourself, fund your travels and meetings, and how you plan and organise it. Oh, I don't know if you girls have anything else to add to that. Um, I would say something interesting, because um, the parliamentary calendar, my like life, it's in cycles. So I noticed that when I came back from my fellowship, I think it was when my report was published. Oh my gosh, I had, I had big bursts of activity. So just before I went, I was, you know, at the House of Lords in July, because Parliament's about to close the week. Most of it crammed in, then quiet. And I went on my fellowship, of course, that was just amazing. Very busy. Came back, kind of quiet. January, springtime, um, you know, around springtime, my report came out, boom. So you have these big bursts sometimes of activity where there's so much going on, you can barely fit it all in. And then it's like really like a wasteland, like a tumbleweed. So don't get depressed or stressed about it. It's just the ebbs and flows of how these, you know, policymakers they work on according to a calendar like everyone else. Um, and in terms of cost, like um, Lindsay said, yeah, just be honest. Say I can't afford to get to this, or in terms of time and your job or your life and family, just say, well, this has come up. I'm really sorry, I can't make. It. Don't feel like if you miss one event, the doors are shut forever. You know, if you know you've got, um, you have status there as well. You know, you can. Everyone has times when they need to take a step back. Don't give up. You know, um, the, don't give up on what you're doing on the work. You know, it's okay if you have to wait a while to get things together to get the next bit in. There. Um, sometimes things will just keep ticking over. So just keep, you know, keep up with your work, your day-to-day -day things, your reading. Keep reading as 
the research that's coming out, keep yourself up to date, um, keep your honourables that when another door opens, as it will, it will open, you're ready to go through it. So that's really important. But yeah, the parliamentary schedule can be a bit crazy. Mm. Because, you know, they have such funny holidays and everyone wants everything at once, so that's interesting. There's a, there's a list of APPGs, and you go on the parliamentary website as well, I would say, I think there's about 600 of them, I think. Mm. So it's worthwhile checking for if any of the APPGs align to your topic, and also the parliamentary calendar is there, so look and see when the parliament, parliament's in recess, so that you can try, just as, as Eva said, the calendar's quite tight, so check where the APPG fits with you, and also check with the, with the times with the, the, calen, uh, the calendars, because Inevitably, MPs will be in their own constituencies on a Monday morning and a Friday, so schedule your meetings midweek. That would be the thing if you're trying to get an MP or a minister, always go for midweek. There's been a lot of talk about APPGs. Um, and I should say, if you go to our website and look in the Fellowship Documents section, there is a new guideline on how to work with APPGs, so that might be useful. Sarah, we have another question. Yes, we do, and this is a request for advice from someone who has no previous experience influencing government policy, um, what would you recommend being the first point of call? So, local MPs are always good. They've usually got a good interest in constituency matters. So if you have a constituency matter, that, that's interesting. And I think um, you might have been, uh, things you said about aligning things with policy. So when you're thinking about your work, just reading the policies, reading the relevant policies that you want to influence is a, is a good start, mm -hmm. I think. Then it's a lot easier to think about who you want to influence. Finding out as well which MPs have got a specific interest, and that's where the, the APPGs are very good, because you can see who sits on them, who chairs them. So it might be basketball, I think, well, who's the chair of that APPB? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to write to them. Um, another thing, if I would always say, always go to the top. Write to the Prime Minister, write to the First Minister. <laughs> don't, don't, you know, go straight to the top always with your first gambit so that you can say thereafter to everyone else, actually, I've written to the hoo ha on this, you know. So I would definitely say go to the top. And uh, I should have, oh, sorry, I've just thought of another yeah, thing. Um, don't just think about the lower house. The upper house has lots, so the, the House of Lords mm -hmm. got lots of interested people doing lots of interesting things. Who are incredibly influential, actually, and quite often will lead a, lead an entire sort of stream of work on something. So have a think about them too. I think that's a really good point, actually, Alison, because um, peers, members of the House of Lords, have more time on their hands, yeah. and also they're not always so tied into party lines on things. They can be much more independent. A lot of them are not party figures at all. Yes. They're actually experts in lots of different topics, mm. and that's why they've been appointed. So that's mm. a really good hunting ground, definitely. And they don't change at an election. They're there forever. And can I just say on that point, I was so impressed from my first roundtable meeting. Um, Alan Howarth, particularly, he's a peer, and you know, he's um, I think he's got an unusual history. He's been both a Conservative but also a Labour MP, so he's got very interesting history. But I've never, in all the meetings, he has taken the most notes of anybody. And you know, we have all these sort of stories in the news, and yeah, some you know about peers and it's whatever. But I have never seen someone so committed to this sort of cause of arts and health. He's he doesn't stop working. He doesn't stop networking. It's obviously something he's very passionate about. Um, so it's surprising who you can find. Um, as as you were saying about the allies behind closed doors, there's people that really do um, have a they're like-minded like you, and you can actually make some real good allies in the House of Lords. Lovely. Um, when you find someone who's so hard working, it's like finding a diamond, you know, and that can really push your cause forward. It's wonderful. The other one for me was a Rolls Royce doesn't work without oil, and remember that. And that's when your admin people are really support are really supportive. So you're talking there about. I always used to find out what their PA's name was and find out you know who their secretary was because if you can make friends with them, they are often the gatekeepers. So I would definitely say that that's definitely a do it on your on your list of, of finding out you know to get to people and find out who the who the oil for the Rolls Royce is. That is so true, and quite often when I've tried to present a particular topic that wasn't central to that MP's interest, but their researcher would be deputed to go and sort of get rid of me, and then you meet the researcher a few times and finally go up the ladder till the MP sees you themselves because the research has kind of paved the way for you. So that's, yeah, and parliamentary researchers and indeed any policy 
organization, if you're talking about local councils, policy units, you know, that's mm -hmm. a good place to talk to. Yeah. yeah. Another question? Yes. Uh, so a question from a fellow who doesn't feel very confident with public speaking and doesn't feel they're much of an extrovert. And uh, what would your advice be about the best way to make impact? I'm, I'm an introvert. <laughs> I'm very introverted, actually. I've been gripped terribly with imposter syndrome since doing this, I have to admit. <laughs> um, going on Women's Hour just crystallised that, actually. Um, actually, spent a little bit of my fellowship money um, going to RADA. Going, I did a drama course Goodness. for two days to learn how to speak. <laughs> and it's been tremendous. Um, it was... It, was um, it helped me really gain confidence and I've always been okay speaking to big groups because I've, you know, I've worked in a university and everything and I've done lots of speaking about subjects but actually speaking to big groups and interacting I found very very challenging so I completely sympathize um, but that really helped me um, so I think it's really about finding something understanding what it is that's, that's maybe holding you back for one thing and then having a strategy for how you might cope with that Remember, so you know, I remember the first time I spoke in front of an audience was about 300 people, and my knees were knocking. I had a dress on. I was thinking nobody will see my knees knocking. You know more about this topic than they do, so yeah. you've got an advantage. Mm. The minute you stand up to speak, you're there because you're an expert, and all of us fellows are experts. We spent a lot of our time and our effort learning about this topic, so you will know more. And once you start to speak about it with the passion that Eva was talking about earlier on, people start to listen. And you forget, you forget the nervousness that you have. So I would say if you're if you're really nervous, start with a small audience, you know, um, whether that's a local a local small local group just to test out your 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 skills. And don't be afraid because you know a lot more about what you're talking about than anybody else in the room. Mm. Yeah, I love that actually. Um, mm. Being a musician, uh, preparation practice really makes a difference. So mm. I will very rarely perform a song, like especially on a big stage, you know. I've never played it to someone else, even just my best friend alone in the room. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, if you've got a pet, pet you know, speak to your little speech to your dog, and actually that will help sort of put a bit of fun into it. Um, find someone who's supportive and try speaking with them, and then, you know, try a bit of a bigger audience, depending on what the plat final platform's going to be. If you really have very little experience, you know, to get a nice, supportive, because actually what you find is even certain words as you're saying them. Um, you might trip up over it when you're with your best friend, but they think, oh, I'll be mindful of that word when I give my big talk. So mm. it can just, you know, help smooth things out. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Alison. I think a tip for introverts is, um, at least most introverts I know, it's about the way you use your energy. So being with lots of people, even though you might find it really stimulating, is actually quite draining for us. We, we don't get our energy from other people. Um, so when I was actually traveling, I made sure that I had half days or days where I didn't have a meeting and I had time to reflect and that was really valuable to me and I got a lot more out of the fellowship I think from doing that because I was able to then pace myself and pace my energy so that when I did have meetings particularly with quite large groups or people that were, um, had a lot to say I was able to make the best of it. Thanks. Another question? Indeed. So how do you get involved with APPGs? Do you have to apply to take part or what's the process? I just emailed them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I just emailed them. Most of them have got a, an email address. I emailed them. Um, a couple of the, so the, the one I was particularly interested in was the safety one, patient safety one, emailed them. The Some of the other APPGs, um, I knew through through networks, so emailed the chair. So I'll definitely say that uh, some some APPGs ask for membership, some don't. I never pay for anything. I'm a Scots woman, so I always go to the <laughs> APPGs where there's no membership. And also offering to do an input about a piece of policy. So it, you know, if mm. you have a, something that you think will be relevant to that APPG, you write them a small email and saying, "My name is so and so. I've just done a Winston Churchill Fellowship. This is why I found out. I would love to be able to come and tell you my findings." And they'll give you five or ten minutes, and mm. or it may just invite you along to, to listen for the first time. But once you're on the mailing list for it, that's it. You're in. Mm. Yes, mm. it's worth saying that although they are groups of MPs, they actually have 
um, a membership which will usually be a free membership um, and that will include civil society organizations interested individuals members of the public anyone else and they will tend all to get invited to the talks that they hold at the house of westminster which of course means you're inside the door mm. yeah so if, if you're doing something that perhaps a charity is aligned to the appg with it's worth approaching the charity that's working with the appg mm. Sorry. Yes, and on a similar theme, how do you contact the Lords? Has anybody done that around well, this table? Mm. That's a question I pray, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's <laughs> <different ones>. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, it's interesting. I mean, ask the two ladies to say, once you're in, it's getting in the door, because that's when you make these unexpected um, kind of meetings and appointments. You know, you go to a meeting and someone may just turn up who you never quite expected to meet. Mm. And then you start a conversation and then you find out you've got so much in common. Mm. So just keep, you know, be open minded. If you get offered an invitation to an event, if you can make it, go. You never know who's going to be there. Um, and it can be like a chain reaction. So and so knows, so and so who introduces so and so. It's just being part of the community um, of policymakers because that's, you know, you're part of that community. Once you're in that APG, you're informing policy now. So. Um, it gives you a seat at the table, and you never know who might come on for dinner. So there we are. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you go onto the um, the House of Parliament website, it does give a list of all the lords. There are quite a few hundred of them, but um, you know they are individuals. It will list their interests. It will probably give their postal or email address, uh, and then just treat them as individuals. Mm. A lot of them are appointed for life. They're not um, you know ancient aristos at all. Um, they're just working people who've got a specialism. It's quite interesting. I've had um, I've worked with some people in the House of Lords through networks or professional relationships, but it's quite. Interesting. I've had some very interesting conversations with at least two peers this week on Twitter. So there you are. They're bang up to speed. <laughs> they are, yeah. <laughs> and they are just people, but people who can help you, I think. And in terms of organising your thoughts and progressing your ideas, do you have any creative ways in which you do that? For example, mind maps, and do you, is it a paper-based method or a digital method? Well, I came in here yeah. writing on my mobile phone. <laughs> I think if I met Alison and Lizzie, I was literally finishing off a piece of work on my mm -hmm. phone. So um, the great thing is the mobile office, you know, technology now, there's an app for all, almost everything. Um, I found um, there's some lovely apps where you can actually jot things down. Um, I'm currently like writing like a whole poetry app on my phone. There's apps where you can record um, spoken, you know, your thoughts if you're on the move or you know, don't, well, you know, bumpy train or something. You can just speak into them, record things as you go. It's just doing what you, what you find mo most comfortable and most accessible. Because if it's too um, regimented, it will put you off even getting started. So I find that you know just Go with the simple, t simple whatever that has. And keep it fluid. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I have a, a um, um, ever perpetuated list that I use my, with my diary. So once I've done something, I feel I've achieved it, and I can strike it off my list. And then there's something else that comes up, and you put it on the bottom of the list. So I've got an ever expanding list that that um, I I work from. But I also make it a spinner for my diary. I think about where I'm going to be in the country, who I can contact when I'm there, make the most of the time. Even today I'm thinking who who am I going to be meeting after this? Um so utilizing your time well, that's the other thing is um and making time, I think the bit that you made earlier on about making time for yourself to think. Mm -hmm. Thinking time and reading mm -hmm. time is really important. You need to keep up with the policy, you need to keep up with the research because you need to always be like at the top of your game when you're meeting policy and when you're influencing policy. I, I would never be or doing the things that I'm doing now if I didn't keep abreast of what, what developments that are coming out. So keeping an eye on government websites um, as well for policy government uh, policy coming out, keeping an eye on the media and news. Twitter's great for that as well for following what's mm -hmm. happening locally as well. So um, and being being sort of almost on alert, a bit like the all those wee things that pop out the ground all the time do that. I don't know what you call them. Meerkat. You know, <laughs> looking around, looking around, be a meerkat, look around. A pet is going back, see what's going on. Never ever miss a trick when it comes to policy. Um, that would be the thing that I'd say. But list, for me, it was list. You know, I just I constantly write lists. Now, I am a visual thinker, so I do use things like mind maps. I find them really helpful. So, um, yeah, I actually took a, I'm, I'm very much into technology and I really like mathematics, but um, I actually took a a notebook and paper, uh, a pencil with me. 
and wrote things down. Um, and the the interesting thing about when I realised my tra my fellowship had transformed, I was actually at the, towards the end of the first part of my fellowship in Washington, and I, I, I'd gone to an art gallery to look at look at the paintings, but also reflect. And it was when the sort of things clicked for me, and I realised things had changed. So being able to understand how you learn best, I think, is really important because everybody's different, and everybody's going to have a different way of making the most of opportunity and making the most of what they learn from the fellowship. And actually, just to add to that, can I just say, um, reflection seems to be a common theme here. Mm -hmm. And um, you've been given the fellowship, yes, but you're also, Churchill doesn't mind, wouldn't have minded if you enjoyed yourself. So I would say, um, you know, definitely find a way that you can really enjoy the learning you're doing and then the work you do when you come back but also allow it to change you. That's what I found so powerful about the fellowship. It's totally changed me in um, very good ways, you know, in um, boldness, in um, being more open-minded, in dreaming a bigger dream, you know, um, and all these things, it's, it's all part of life's journey. It's all part of being a to enjoy mm -hmm. your journey. And when you have that enthusiasm, you just kind of drag other people with yeah. you. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's very yeah, true. Have a good time with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> have a request from a, or for advice from a fellow who's currently lobbying um, an NHS commissioning body where there are currently multiple providers of a service and he's, lo he's lobbying to have a single provider and that was the focus of his fellowship. Um, and uh, they're asking how, how to build pressure to influence change. He says, everyone I speak to from patients' health boards and some of the commissioning body agree that my proposal makes sense but that's where it ends. Would lobbying at a parliamentary level be useful or any other ideas as welcome? Definitely. Um, you know, if you're not getting anywhere with your local folk, always, as I say, go to the top. Um, and so I would be make a short story about, about um, the, the, the barriers that you've got and that you're trying to overcome. So try your local MP first. Uh, and then if you don't get any joy with your local MP, go straight to the top. Um, so I would definitely try your local MP first. So yes, in short, the answer is yes to your question. I would definitely say go above where you are now. Um, there's obviously barriers or blockers. Something's not happening if, you're, if they're not taking you on, particularly if you've got a good idea and you know it makes sense and people have told you it makes sense. Gather testimonies from the people that you've spoken to. Ask them if they're willing to put something in writing so that they can, you can give sound bites of what they've said to you to the people that you want to to be, but always go to the job. I'm very happy, by the way, post this um, webinar to speak to anybody, and I'm sure the ladies would be the same mm -hmm. as well, yeah. um, to speak to anybody about what we've learned, post this, you know, you can email us or whatever to be able to share anything else that we can, we can have on that. Alison, did you want to come in on that question? Yeah, it's a situation I'm quite often in, actually, <laughs> um, particularly when people are looking at the workforce around the service because there's been very little um, workforce planning around a lot of what the commissioning groups have done and what I've learned is that it's an incredibly political situation so it doesn't matter sometimes how good your idea is and how much sense it makes there's something else at play that might be stopping things moving forward and I think it's really important to understand what that is unfortunately the, the system that we have puts lots of agendas up against each other and, and figuring out some of that and unraveling it and then thinking about where you can influence it might be a way forward. And I would say definitely, um, sometimes the biggest battle is within, so try not to get disheartened if you mm. hear roadblocks yeah. and obstacles, because you know, this is the real world we live in. There yeah. will be times that are easier and times that are really tough, so don't freak out. And um, remember, sometimes a door closes so that a window somewhere else can open, and every single experience you can learn from. So, um, you know, just go back, you know, let your, you know, collect your thoughts, but um, there'll always be another day and hopefully another opportunity because if you've got a good idea, that good idea is not going to disappear just because someone else didn't like it. It's still a good mm. policy, it's still a good way of working and someone somewhere is bound to receive it at some point, so yeah. Didn't Stephen Hawking say something about having a good idea and never giving up? Yeah. 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 Never give up, that would be the thing. Never give up. Well, that's an inspiring note for us to end on, in fact. So thank you to our guests, Eva Okwonga, Alison Leary, and Lindsay Graham. Uh, thank you, the audience, for tuning in. Um, this webinar will be uh, circulated to everybody who signed up to attend, and it will be lodged on our website for others who want to hear it. 
in the meantime, thank you once again to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.